And uh, thanks a lot uh, um, for attending our session. And I will talk, um, you know, I will work with my colleague, Jeff, and presenting some uh, uh, dual query engine. Uh, no, it's a long title, but basically we are building the dual query engine and the serve both interactive and advanced, so you can think about machine learning or data science and batch pro uh, processing. Okay, and here's the t today's agenda. You know, I will have a quick introduction, talking about uh, what the business problem we try to resolve, and uh, and Jeff will talk about more details, uh, including you know um, generally what the dual query engine we provided, and a lot of technical details and the license we learned and through this dual query engine. Okay, and firstly, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Lei, and uh, I'm working at Workday and uh, leading this team to build uh, the internal data platform. And Jeff, and he will present later, and he's our uh, principal engineer. He will share more technical details. So before talking about uh, the query engine, a quick introduction to Workday, just in case some people and uh, don't know it. Um, Workday is a leading provider for the enterprise cloud application, including finance, HR, and planning. So, uh, firstly, uh, I will talk about um, you know why we want to provide the dual query engine. Uh, because from the technical world, always you know simple is best, better, right? And the single if single query engine can resolve all the issues. No reason we provide tools. So, uh, but uh, give a generally context, and we've built this uh, query engine. And uh, over the last three years, and we are migrating our data platform from our private data center to the AWS, and it's a big mega program. And along this journey, a lot of uh, uh, business questions we want to answer or resolve. One is, for example, scalability and reliability, how we can serve the whole company and uh, you know, with the um, kind of the expected uh, performance. And another one, definitely moving to the cloud. Cost is another you know, factor. And you always need to consider, oh, how we can reduce our cost but provide better performance. And last but not least, uh, usability. And uh, during our data center, we built our data platform, I think, maybe 10 years ago. And we are using Hadoop, we are using Hive, and lately we are using Spark, a bunch of uh, analytics and machine learning tools. And along this journey, definitely we want to modernize and the platform, make sure and uh, uh, workday all the engineer can use uh, you know most updated to date technology and uh, for for the work. Uh, but try to uh, along this journey, and definitely a lot of uh, challenge we try to um, resolve. And but today we want to uh, focus on the um, data accessibility. And people potentially think, oh. It's pretty simple. People can query the data. That's we resolve the problem. But if you look at the company, the, the, the challenge is very uh, complex. And I will not talk about the detail. And I will share the, 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 the presentation later. You can see all the details. But what the table uh, presents is the complexity of uh, addressing the accessibility at Workday or even in any company. If you look at the, that's two dimension complexities, and if you look at the, the, the columns, is that people want to get access to data or query the data from different place. We have people want to query the get, you know, answer from their laptop, definitely. And, but we also have some uh, very complex data pipeline running in our data center and even the, in the public cloud. How we can make sure people can access the data in different place? That's a lot of a challenge, a lot of a security and the privacy question and the technology definitely. And if you look at the roles and we have a different use case and the simple enough like the people want to get on, you know, ask some ad hoc questions and how they get, get the answer quickly. And we also have some reporting on the dashboarding, how they can make sure the dashboard refresh the, you know, as expected and uh, quickly. And also, we have some people want to publish or sharing some data, and even some data scientists want to build a you know, more complex data pipeline or even machine learning. So, you know, address different uh, dimension, and uh, there are different requirements. Uh, I just want to present, you know, try to address this question is not pretty easy. So this reason, um, we want to address this question using the dual query engine. And uh, this one is a very high level abstraction in the, uh, how we address this problem. Definitely Jeff will provide the technical details. And, uh, but from this uh, chart you can see, and we are using Presto. It's pretty good for some uh, SQL uh, kind of stuff and similar to Snowflake. And uh, you know, people uh, can use it to answer ad hoc questions, build dashboard and reporting. 
And but also we have provide Spark, and uh, people can use it to build some uh, data pipelines, and uh, some data engineer build uh, you know complex ML pipelines or even some data science models. The the challenging thing is that how we can unify the, the API. When you talk about unify, you talk about a secure and the unified API. And on the top level, it's really like people can access this API from different place using a unified secure model. So I know this one is too abstract. And uh, so this region, Jeff, is here and provide more detail how we, we can achieve this goal. And uh, you know, welcome to Jeff, talking about the, the, the core engines. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, everybody. So, yeah, I will talk a little bit, dive a little bit uh, deep into uh, how our journey goes and what the system looks, the platform looks like. So these are the two years ago when we started this journey. Uh, we have run this for almost 10 years in our data center, a very relaxed system. And when we need to modernize it into the public cloud, and this is where we stand. And we, we, we exactly know that Spark, you just, anybody who will count data, you know, is something you have to have because there you gotta have issues that you have to use code to solve the issue. And uh, so, but Spark is really, I have full respect to the whole Spark community, but Spark does not really have a good SQL interfaces. From API perspective, uh, from JDP, you can use uh, the, uh, what's that services? We have been running, um, for, uh, I forgot one of the term, but uh, there are some workarounds there but really, I really don't like Spark's architecture of having a driver. When you collect something there and uh, when you are collecting, and when you have lots of tools running on top of you, a single collect can crash the whole driver and uh, mess up the whole thing. So yeah, um, Spark is great, have uh, developer APIs, but from the access perspective, it's, it's just something you have to have, but you, there's another part have to be solved. Also, Spark does not really deliver the uh, interactive speed. Uh, typically, in our old days, people submit a query and people go away not just having a coffee. They can go away having a bathroom break and uh, even take a short walk and coming back, the answer is not there yet. So very, very in, in, inefficient in most of the query I've seen. But in Workday, we believe that we investigated the whole platform. We have thousands of users, and the SQL is still our dominant uh, use case. We believe 80% of the, our business questions is, can be found by SQL. But the other 20% having business significance is also have to. So we have two pieces of things we have to deliver. So, so we really need a, a great SQL engine. So this diagram presenting uh, is uh, our interpretation of currently what we have in Workday. Um, at the very bottom is, uh, uh, is our data itself. It's in the high meta store plus data in S3 secured by Kerberos. And uh, uh, all the Workday service around global having a, a centralized, we have a data pipeline continuing pumping up this uh, observability data, the event data into, the, into this as thousands of tables. And the one, the biggest box in the, in the middle is something we call data access services that we created that we don't have before, and this was the unified API and services they just mentioned. It's not a sexy name, but the name reflects what it does. It's providing a unified data access through the APIs. And on top of them, on top of our hosted uh, analytics suites, so including uh, catalogs, super, I believe uh, pretty, these are pretty standard analytic uh, stack that uh, superset for visualization, you have notebook, and also have pipelines. And within this data access service, if you look at here, we can have, we have now, instead of having, we used to have the, our Spark stack there, we also have the, I use Trino and the Presto in randomly, but they are essentially the same thing. Also, we have some platform service and access gateway give us ability to authenticate. So the most important abstraction is the APIs that is providing uh, SQL, Spark, and AG APIs. So these are the general architecture in a single diagram. Now I dive a little bit deep into each of the, uh, the actual, the, the whole things we, from inception to put into action, took about a year and a half. What do you have done through this? So these are the most important things we have done into, uh, to 
to customize to customize the open source Trino to with all the enterprise integrations. So the you can bring up a Trino pretty easily, probably in half a day, a day with the current public cloud. But having all the right enterprise integration done is really is not easy. So these are the, for example, the um, I, I try to highlight some important uh, uh, integration are done. For example, authentication. We use both Kerberos and also the JWT uh, authentication, so we can. So we can authenticate in both impersonated service users or the end user directly. Um, the governance part, we have query limits, where I talked a little bit more on the lessons learned uh, resource groups. So this is how we regulate the users. Uh, RBSE robust access control, we use the Trino native uh, robust access control customizations. Uh, connectors, uh, we have Hive, uh, MySQL, also we use system and GMX for observability. So these are the customizations. Uh, Trino is, uh, uh, if you are not familiar, uh, Presto Trino is a uh, uh, full Java application. So all the plugin customization is done through uh, customized uh, plugins. So we also have the group subsystem we customize to integrating with our uh, AirDAP services. And also we have a customized uh, query, uh, query lock plugins so these are give us a very deep insight into what the, what the user are doing, what the system are doing. So yeah, these are the about the customization of the how we integrate the Trino services. And uh, the next slide is about uh, the the Spark stack. We heavily uh, leverage the AWS EMR already having most of the Hadoop components here, and also we have we put the addition of the Apache Knox on top of the. Uh, if we look at it from bottom to top, it's going to be the standard Hadoop stack that is HDF, KMS, YARN, then Spark on running on top of it. And we use Livy as the open source Livy as the API uh, front end for the Spark. And also we heavily leverage, if you look at the Spark, if you want to run Spark through a pure API, it's not enough. You have to leverage, you have to put your program, all the resources onto the cluster from a user client to the cluster. So we heavily leverage Web HDFS and also the uh, young to for off to young APIs, and uh, the Knox give us ability to uh, to do the uh, centralized uh, JWT authentication and the, basically the bring the user from a user end user identity to the Kerberos world, and also its proxy actually Knox proxy the whole Hadoop APIs pretty nicely, so yeah. And, and based on this, we actually build our own Spark SQL, Spark Batch, all the, our custom solutions pretty nicely, so here. So this is actually the, uh, we developed this for about half, uh, one and a half year, and having a six months to bring, to migrate all our users from data center to new platform. This is how the whole landscape looks like today. So I mark them all as blue color as all the platform components. Everything else is done through the user because we providing a self-service user model. We don't rec we don't tell user what to do. We give them the ability to to do their works. So, so we have uh, migrated thousands of users. So still underneath is the data self, the data access services, and we also develop uh, our own command line interface, just like the AWS CRI. So we call it CRI. It's, it started as a hobby side project as it become really, really essential parts of the whole platform too. Because if you look at all the APIs, they're very low level, some of them are very low level REST APIs. And uh, we use our command line interfaces to bring bridge all them together to making the user centric. And maybe if I have time, I can do a little bit query, a little bit demo later. And on top of our hosted analytics suite, and our user right now have the full ability because the open APIs they can do their own developing environment, doing all various kinds of integrations very easily. They can run tablet desktop, they can run Jupyter, and just directly either leverage your CIs or through the APIs. Also, the Workday applications can integrate with the API directly. With uh, Actually, we are very, very happy with uh, the Presto SQL APIs. With it, lots of integration happen just, uh, uh, just naturally. Um, lessons learned, uh, we share a few lessons and best practice, we have done this. Um, I will cover them 
just going by one by one. First is make best use of the two engines. Now we have two stacks to give us full ability, but they each have their own strengths and also weakness. Uh, Trino is very, very str strong on querying data. You give them different joining the data, querying data itself. So we basically, we help, we drive all, most of our query use cases to on the channel side. It's required a little bit of migration, study, and learning, all the things, but it works it because we generally observe three to 10 times faster in general. It's very general, this is the estimation. Faster on channel when you run the same query versus a similar amount of Spark, uh, Spark with similar amount of resources. If you get three times faster, basically means you can, one third of money you spend, right? In public cloud, cost is one thing you constantly bother you. So, also, but, but a spark of the strength is on the metadata meta, 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 meta store itself, because Trino doesn't expose lots of things to you. So it generally is for query purposes. You try to bring the data together. But we have some cases, the 20% important cases that you need to write the data. And these are the things we highly, highly utilize Spark because Spark gives you a whole lot of flexibility in write all the operations. So, uh, governances. Um, we are an open platform to our thousands of internal Workday users. So, governance is extremely important. Users doing lots of use. If you look at the platform, platform perspective, lots of dumb things happening every day. And the runaway query, we have seen queries running for. The worst query I think is running for two days on the system, a large cluster. <laughs> so extremely important, uh, you put enough governance and uh, to keep platform healthy and ensure the fairness. Uh, for example, we, we enforcing partition column in all the filter. You have to have a partition columns because otherwise the full table scan, it can scanning, it can scan in petabytes of data. If we have some, sometime a business user come in, they have no idea what's partition. They have no idea, they just do select star. This happens every, actually every day, pretty much. And uh, on channel side, uh, we do uh, some of the general query, per query based limits like max memory, max memory per node. Uh, we also, very important, we apply a max execution time to enforcing you cannot have a wrong way queries there. Or if you have a query running for, let's say, exceeding the the maximum exit time, you have to optim optimize your query. So also we use resource group to limiting per user or system how many in parallelism you can have. And Spark Young, we did something similar. So these are the price actually we are paying for having to, to anything, you, you get something, you pay, these are the price we pay here, so you figure out two query engines. And sometimes their configuration are quite different. Um, another important learning is that uh, separation of ad hoc and the pipeline uh, workloads. We have learned very hard lesson from our Alexis system. We mix everything together in a single huge cluster. It's so bad that you cannot regulate things easily. So sometimes a giant ingestion workload there can passing the whole, basically blocking, making the whole cluster unusable for 15 minutes or something. So, so here is the one we designed this from ground. This is a new system. We completely separate them from at the hardware level, at the physical level. We, use, we were using different clusters with different regulations. One is for ad hoc. You have, ad hoc is, is meant to be your development purposes. You run some small queries, development, figure out what data is, testing your code. And when you run the pipeline, you do months of aggregation, all the things you want to put into a different cluster. So these are, we have a two, completely separate separation of different solutions. They each have a with different cluster and they're proven to be much easier to regulate. It's, it's like you, when you design uh, object oriented, you at the subclass level, you are very clear, have a very good context. This is exactly what you do and this is exactly regulations we. Um, also, uh, I don't know if anybody run Presto or Trino uh, as a heavy user, but this is something I, we read it before, before we deployed it, we read it from like uh, um, Uber, Lyft, they're all having some kind of weekly restart because the Trino are very, very heavy, it's a, it's a JVM. And especially if, if you look at this one, we are running thousands of queries every day, a very heavy query, basically this JVM being hammered, hammered <laughs> really, really badly. 
And uh, Lyft having a weekly sign, finally we figure out that we want to actually daily restart. If you look at this, one of the, one of the uh, CPU usage of 24 hours, the top, top one. If you look at some of these windows are 100% constantly for like three or four hours. I believe these are the deep, the JVM uh, deep uh, full GC starting kick in. And it just cannot get out, the system getting slower and everything getting slower. And finally, we say we, we, we experimented again and we figured out that we do actually uh, a daily, uh, a daily well, low traffic time. On the pipeline side, we're having a retry mechanism. Basically, we, every day we restart the whole service without introducing it, without bringing down the cluster editing. One or two minutes, these are what the new, I actually really, really like this spiky pattern. If you look at here, this, this means there are quite some queries, but these are really healthy, keep things healthy, basically, perform really well. When we found that a train will never restart for five days, it can be 10 times slower than it's supposed to be. Can be more than that. Sometimes you can just see the IO is slower, everything is slower. Just the, you used to have a query returning back 10 minutes, now it's taken an hour or even longer. So these are what the uh, practice we have been doing. Uh, what the time, we still have time? Okay, yeah, the final one, uh, the page I want to have is uh, is the observability. Um, we are putting quite a lot, of, we believe it's actually, we spend, we invest a lot in the observability and, and uh, all the operational. So observability in my uh, mind, we have run this for six months. And uh, basically you know what users are doing on your system. Find out the extremes, the, uh, the, uh, the extremes, and figure out why it's unreasonable, figure out a way to take, take them out and also figure out how your system being utilized. If your system is being underutilized, you want to make your, because we, we, we have been continuing hunting on the cost. We are over budget, basically, <laughs> always. And uh, uh, been pushing to uh, cutting down cost, but you want to cut it at the right place, so you always relying on the observability data to tell you where to cut instead of blindly cut things. So, we have been doing quite a lot of this, and uh, even before the meeting, I told Lee that, for example, one of our, I can give an example of the, uh, the uh, very, I hope this window is still open. Yeah, this is one of the observability data. This is our ad hoc. We have 20 nodes here, uh, 20 monitors node here. But here, you can here, this is one week. You can clearly tell where the, where the weekend is. And also, we have very, very cyclical pattern of of the, uh, we having two user group, a majority of workforce in the, in the Pleasanton side on the US. We also have the Europe having some of the user using, but if you look at, if you zoom into in a day or something, you can clearly see the US starts work and Europe starting pick up some work. So, so if you look at here, and it's, it's fairly certain you can do certain optimization. So that's what I'm trying to convey in this, um, I think, uh, yeah, I probably in the, it's uh, full screen mode. Anyway, I will use this one. Yeah, just, uh, um, I, I won't talk too much detail on the how, because observability generally means you capture enough information through uh, metrics, through logs, query logs, these are all the important important things you can do with your system and uh, keep it operating healthy and uh, uh, we, are, we are right about time. Any quick questions we can, and also we will be in the, after this meeting, we will be, uh, after this, we will be in the, um, yeah, I won't go through this one. So we will be in the Q&A sessions if you have any, yeah, let us know. Anything from you, Lee? Five minutes, yeah, any quick questions or any comments? Um, anybody? Yeah, so maybe I can do a quick, very, very quick demo of the, of the client, uh, of the, uh, of the CI. I have, we found it, I didn't add into the slide, so it's like the, uh, um, because our, our platform is called, oops.
because our our platform is called uh, Ferro. So it's, it's essentially, if you look at here, is like uh, just like uh, uh, the uh, AWS. So uh, AWS CI. So we have a command. We have services. We have uh, we have things. So most importantly, we have the SQL services. So we can. So we can do, we can run a SQL, we can bring your own data to the platform, we can do bring your own data, bring your SQL to the platform, all the various things. So wrapping everything as the, uh, and we, we even actually uh, leverage the, uh, the open source CI framework. So everything, the usage is like, uh, so for example, on the Spark side, Spark is more complicated, actually each of the command wrapping multiple uh, Hadoop, all the uh, APIs to make it work. So. So these are just, uh, and uh, and this is one of the screenshots. The one I just run before the one I do. I run this run everything through our Spark SQL and getting a very simple aggregation back through uh, JSON. So we just learn from the, what AWS does with the CI. So you give a command, you give your options, and the output is a JSON. And it, as you can do lots of automations, a user can do very easy automations through here. It's become Starting with a side project and become a very essential part of the whole platform, actually. Yep, that's, uh, that's about it. Thank you.